I've been saying repeatedly on your show and to my students is that I believe that hacking radio signals is really the, the next level. I'm so glad the Flipper Zero came out because the Flipper Zero has made everybody aware of all the possibilities of radio hacking we've been ignoring for all these years. If you're just sitting there throwing up firewall rules and, and using you know, an IDS or whatever to try to prevent attacks, if you don't really understand what the hacker is doing, it's, you're going to be working blind. So I strongly recommend that if you want to be a cybersecurity pro, not necessarily a hacker, that you study hacking. I personally wouldn't connect to a free Wi-Fi without the use of a VPN, because you never know if it's a legitimate Wi-Fi access point or a rogue Wi-Fi access point. Now, based on the recommendations of hackers, cybersecurity experts that I've spoken to and books such as these, the VPN provider that I've been using for a long time is Proton VPN. One of the concerns people have, however, is how fast is the connection to the VPN? In this example, I've connected to Proton VPN in the UK, so a local connection. Let's see how fast this is gonna be. So I'll go to fast.com. Now in no way is this scientific and the speeds that you get may be very different. But at the time of this recording, those are the speeds I'm getting. When I tested this earlier, I was getting 610 megabits per second down. So if I was using public Wi-Fi and I would be very careful doing that, I would always use a VPN. If I'm using a connection in a hotel, I would use a VPN. This is an example of the speeds that I've been getting using a local connection. Speeds of course will vary and you may get very different speeds to me. As in all things in life, you need to weigh up the pros and cons of using the internet with or without a VPN. Personally, if I was using a public Wi-Fi connection or a connection in a hotel, I would always want to use a VPN. And Proton VPN is the VPN that I've been using once again for a long time. Big shout out to Proton for sponsoring this video. Hey everyone, it's David Bumble back with the amazing Occupy the Web. Occupy the Web, welcome. Thank you, David. It's always great to be on the best IT and cybersecurity channel on YouTube. As always, I really appreciate you saying that, and you're a big reason for that. Now, if you, who the viewers who are watching, haven't seen our previous videos, I've linked them below. Occupy the Web and I have done a whole bunch of videos. If you don't know who he, who he is, you should by now, but um, in case you don't, he's the author of this book, Linux Basics for Hackers, fantastic book. Sorry, Occupy the Web and I have also created a series of videos covering a bunch of topics in this book, so I've linked that below as well. Occupy the Web has also written this book, Getting Started, Becoming a Master Hacker, and Network Basics for Hackers, one of my favorite books because I love networking. Occupy the Web, we were talking offline that you covered some of it in this book, but we're going to do an updated version for 2024. A comment I often see on YouTube is people say, I've installed Kali Linux or ParadoS or something. Now what? You know, what tools should I look at using? And I'm hoping that you're going to show us your top 10 hacking tools. I'd love to show you my top 10 hacking tools. I, I, do, cover, I do cover it in the book, Getting Started, Coming Master Hacker, but I'm going to do a little bit of an update on that list and, and kind of show you what's, ha what, what's happening now, Great. what tools I think are most important, um, and show you the latest versions of them. You know, if you're starting out as you know, a cybersecurity pro or hacker, you know, I, I think I kind of use those terms in, interchangeably because I really think as a cybersecurity pro, you should know how to hack because you really can't defend what you can't do. I mean, if you don't yeah. understand hacking, you're not going to be a good defender. You know? exactly. you're, 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 if you're just sitting there throwing up firewall rules and, and using you know, an IDS or whatever to try to prevent attacks, if you don't really understand what the hacker is doing, it's, you're going to be working blind. So I strongly recommend that if you want to be a cybersecurity pro, not necessarily a hacker, that you study hacking. That's going to make you better at becoming a cybersecurity defender. And for whatever that's worth, let's let's get started then, okay? One of the first tools that I think everybody should know, no matter what field you're in, in IT, cybersecurity, hacking, what have you, is Wireshark, right? Wireshark is it's a wonderful tool, and I know you've had a number of people on your channel talking about Wireshark, but let's just talk about it briefly here and just show you. Now, one of the things that you may not be accustomed to if you're coming from a different environment than Linux is that in Linux, you can oftentimes, most times, not all the times, but most of the time, 
simply type the name of the tool you want to use in the command shell and it'll open it up. Of course, you also have the option of using a menu system here, right? And you can go ahead and search around for your Wireshark or whatever. You can type in Wireshark here and find the link to it. And there it is right there. You can see it. Okay. But we're going to just use it from the command line. And we're just going to go, just go sudo Wireshark. Sudo because we need root privileges to do certain things in Wireshark. So let's go ahead and put our password in. For those of you who aren't familiar, sudo gives us root privileges in Linux. And so the first thing you're going to come up with in the, when you open up the Wireshark, it says Wireshark Network Analyzer. Those of you who might be taking some of the certification exams out there, CEH, SEC Plus, what have you, um, you might run across the term Protocol Analyzer. All right, so that often is used to describe Wireshark as a protocol analyzer or a network analyzer. You can see that as I open it up, it's showing me the possible interfaces and you can see the activity and there's one that says any interface and the other one says ETH zero, right? ETH zero is ethernet zero, our first ethernet adapter. Remember that in computers, we always start counting at zero, not at one. So every, the first item in the list is always zero, not one. That takes some getting used to if you're not, uh, if you haven't been part of this world. Let's go ahead and click there and it'll begin to show me the packets that are coming across that interface. If I don't see any packets coming across the interface, I can always create some by, say, just going to opening up a browser. There we go. You can start to see the packets coming across there now. It took a little delay there. This is, this is Wireshark, and what it's doing is it's sniffing the packets going across, in my case here, ETH0, the Ethernet adapter, and the first Ethernet adapter. You might have more than one Ethernet adapter, in which case they would be called Ethernet 1. The second one would be called Ethernet 1. The third one would be called Ethernet 2. Okay. And these, this is the live feed of packets that it's sniffing, okay? and it shows over here, the number of the packet, these are just simply a number starting with one, right? And we're already up to about 10, 9,900 packets. The time since the initiation, since you've opened up Wireshark, course IP address, the destination IP address, the protocol that it's using, the links of the packet, and then some, some simple description of the packet, including you can see here the sequence numbers, you can see whether or not there's a flag set on it. And of course, you know that when we have a three-way handshake that the first packet has a SYN flag and then a SYN ACK and then an ACK and all the packets after that. And that's what's going on over here. We can go ahead and pick any one of these packets. I just clicked on one. And then what that allows me to do then is to go ahead and analyze that packet and I can, I can dig deep into that packet and see everything that's going on inside of it. And this is where I can go ahead and you can see here's a TCP. I expanded it by clicking on the little button there and it'll show me all the key information. And this is not a Wireshark class, but I just wanted to kind of demonstrate simply what it can do. And then you can see there's the ACK numbers. You know, if you know a little bit of TCP, there's the relative sequence number. And then over here, we have the, the payload in hexadecimal. That's one of those skills that you need to know, folks, right? You need to know a little bit of hexadecimal. And then over here, we have an in ASCII, right? So if I were to open up my browser and go to my favorite website, right? Which of course is Hackers Arise, right? I will see it come across the screen. It comes, first of all, it comes to the browser and then we'll see it come over here. So here we did, what we've done is we've searched for the content of the payload, all right, looking for the word hackers. And you can see that it's pulled up here. You can see right here, hackers arise and over here it's in hex. All right, so we're just looking for that one key word. That's all we're looking for. So it's, that's, real basic. One of the things that you want to do if you're using Wireshark is that you want to be able to know how to analyze. And, you know, if you're new 
to networking and cybersecurity, you may not know what to look for and how to create filters. These are called filters up here. We're just trying to take out certain packets and, and just look at them and analyze them. You can see here is analyze, okay? And it says display filter expression right here. What this does is opens up a window and here you can see the thousands of fields that you can search for, all right? So, you know, th these literally, there's thousands of fields that you can search for in, uh, in Wireshark. And let's just go quickly to just like TCP, which is you know, most of what we're doing. Yeah, uh, let's go here, the TCP transmission control protocol right there. And then you can see all of the fields within TCP that I can search for. So for instance, TCP flags, are equal to SID. That will be the opening of a TCP connection. It creates a filter for you. I click on it. I can go over here and say the relation. It defaults to equal equal, which means that it's set, okay, to SID. In other words, it's one, okay. Here's the value one, and it says here set. If I go ahead and click on that, it creates a filter, and then we'll filter for all of the packets that have SIN flags set on it. All right, let's go ahead and get that. And now I've got all of the SIN flag packets, right? So we can go, we can dig really deep into every packet to determine what's going on in those packets. And this is what essential, I would say essential tool for anybody who's working within the field of cybersecurity, networking, what have you. So that's tool number one. I'm going to ask you a question that I think a lot of people will be asking um, Occupy the Web. So I'm going to ask hopefully a lot of like um, beginner questions or questions that the audience might have. And the first thing I'm going to say is like, Occupy the Web, this is not hacking. This is protocol analysis. Why do I need to learn this? Well, you know, some if you're looking about, it's not hacking really. The only part that you could really use Wireshark for, for hacking is to sometimes to analyze, well, first of all, if passwords are being passed unencrypted, okay, in plain text, you, you can see them in Wireshark, right? But if you're trying to understand, say, a hack, so somebody's already hacked, you compromised your system, and you're trying to understand what they did, this is the first step that you would go. If you capture the packets, and then you begin to analyze what they did. So I would agree that it's not hacking, but it's part of the analysis um, tool set that you use both as a network engineer or cybersecurity. So if I'm, if I'm sitting here on the defensive side and I'm being compromised, the first tool I'm going to open is probably going to be Wireshark because I want to understand what that hacker just did to my system. And I can see all of that in Wireshark. Is it also true to say that if the problem a lot of, we see it a lot with in the cybersecurity space that a lot of people who are new just want to jump straight ahead and like they want to run before they can even crawl. And this helps you make sure that you learn what's actually happening on the wire. So you actually understand the protocols that you perhaps trying to hack. I, I would agree a hundred percent. I mean, if you, if you don't really understand TCP IP, you know, it's going to be hard for you to be a successful hacker. You know, you might be able to, you know, use some of the simple tools and you know, maybe compromise somebody's Wi-Fi, what have you. But if you really want to advance and become really adept in this field, you got to understand TCP IP and Wireshark's going to help you because it's yeah. showing you all the information about what's happening on your wire or somebody else's wire. And... That way you're going to better learn how these protocols work and how they are equipped. Now, one of the things that is important to note is that most of what goes on in TCP IP or the other protocols yeah, is all defined by what are called RFCs, requests for comments. And these requests for comments or RFCs define how the protocols should talk to each other. Right, how they can communicate. It's like agreeing that, it, you know, in this case here, we're agreeing that our protocol is has been defined by English. Right? <laughs> and if we're both not speaking English, we're going to have a hard time communicating. Exactly. That's what 
That's what a protocol does or an RRC does to a protocol. It says, okay, we're all going to agree to speak the same language. And here's the rules of the language. And those are defined by RFC. So you can begin to understand how these protocols are defined by analyzing the protocols in Wireshark. It's also important to note that as a hacker, you can defy the protocols. You can defy the RFCs. You don't have to follow the RFCs. The RFCs are designed for people who want to successfully communicate. <laughs> if, you, if you don't, if you don't, if you're not caring, if you don't care about successfully communicating, you can create packets that are not compliant with these rules. And sometimes that can be really helpful to you because by creating packets that are not complying with these rules, sometimes you can get information or get the system to do things that it wasn't intended to do. Now, a really good tool for doing packets that don't meet the uh, RFCs are something like HPing3. HPing3 uh, will allow you to create packets of just about any type. And right now, HPing3 has become one of the, the hackers' most important DDoS tools right now. We're seeing a lot of DDoSs coming from HPing because it allows us to create a packet that defies all of the protocols and the rules of those protocols, which are often they're referred to as RFCs. So I would say that the first thing you need to do is you need to understand networking protocols and Wireshark's the tool to do that, all right? I agree. Okay, good. <laughs> all right, I'm going to close down my Wireshark, and uh, I'm going to, all right. So when I'm closing down Wireshark, I can stop and quit without saving, or I can stop and save. This would be saving all the packets that I can use for later analysis. So I don't have to necessarily do my analysis in real time. I can just open up Wireshark, and it'll automatically save the packets for me. And then I can analyze them at you know, at my leisure, you know, whether that be tomorrow or next week. Right? So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stop without saving. Okay, I'm going to open up a, a target system for us here. And uh, I'm going to do Nmap next. Also. I'm glad you mentioned Wireshark. And it's nice to hear how you're pitching it, not just for hacking, right? But you for cyber security professionals as well. Right. right. We, we, we train both hackers and cyber security. But, but we emphasize that what we call a cyber warrior is somebody who's who's conversant in both offense and defense. Because I really firmly believe that you really can't defend a system. I and mean, I work with a lot of cybersecurity pros, some of them with 10 and 20 years of experience, and they really don't know how their systems are being hacked. They're just following a cookbook of rules that you know they they've been given by you know, the uh, uh, the firewall manufacturer, what have you. And they totally are dependent upon, you know, the new rule sets coming from the wire, the uh, firewall manufacturer or the IDS manufacturer. You really don't understand what's going on. And so we try to train them in how hackers actually work. And then I think they're better at defending their networks. So let's go ahead and clear. Okay. So... I've gone ahead and, and uh, I've opened up a target system, and my target system here is going to be Dragon OS. Uh, Dragon OS is an SDR, it's a Debian based Lubuntu, actually. It's a Lubuntu based operating system that is tuned for doing radio hacking. It's got a whole lot of tools in it. I use it, it's a great tool, it's a great operating system. And so we're going to be using it as our target. So let's just do a quick if config. You can see that it uses different notation, okay, for the interfaces than Debian does. Hopefully this doesn't throw people off. Let me expand the screen to show it a little larger zoom in. Whereas Debian calls the first inter Ethernet interface ETH0, the Ubuntu, and those of you who are using Ubuntu will notice that it's using a different notation. In this case, it's ENS 
33. Here's my IP address. And then I'm going to go ahead and try scanning that system. So our next tool that is an essential tool for anybody in cybersecurity or hacking is Nmap. Nmap's been around forever, 25 years now, I think. Yeah, 25 years. About 1998 or 97 is when it first came out. And it's still great. It's still a great tool. It's an essential tool. And so one of the things we want to do is just type Nmap and then just do N dash H to see all of the options. There's a lot of options. I'm going to expand this and so if we can see all of the help screen. So I just opened up for the help screen to show you there's just lots and lots of options. And sometimes this can be overwhelming to the newcomer, but in reality, Nmap is pretty simple. All right, so let's see if we can't uh, and just boil it down to real simple terms of what how to work with Nmap. It's in lots of options. If you want to go ahead and scan, now what this tool does in its most basic form is it is going to tell you first, is the target system online? That's the first thing. So the first thing it does is it sends an ICMP, a ping, to the target and waits to see whether or not that ping came back. If it comes back, it will then begin to scan the top 1,000, not the first 1,000, but the top 1,000 ports, right? Why ports? Ports represent a service. It's where a service connects to the internet. So for instance, we know HTTP, is on port 80 usually, right? By default, it's on port 80. So if we see port 80 open on a system, we know that HTTP is running on that system. Why is that important? Because there, if we want to attack HTTP, first thing we gotta know is whether or not it's actually running. And not every system has port 80 open on it. If we're trying to attack, for instance, SMB, that's port 445, we would check to see whether or not that system has, has port 445 open at it. If it is, then we can begin to explore the possibilities of attacking it. So the first thing you wanna know is what ports are open on that system? And this is how we do it. Real simple, Nmap, okay, then dash S, that's scan. Now, the next step is the type of scan, and there's many types of scan you can do with Nmap. But really, the most basic and probably the most important is a T-scan. A T-scan is simply a TCP scan, which means that it creates a three-way handshake with the target system. We know that to create any type of TCP connection to a target, whether it be your, your web server, website, what have you, it has to first create a three-way handshake. That's the most reliable type of scan. So we can do that with a T. And then we just got to give it the IP address. That's all we have to do. So all that, all these other options that are out there, right, we can ignore them for right now and simply go 192, 168, 107. Uh, I forgot the IP address. Let's go back. <laughs> 107, 136. Okay. Da dot 136. Right. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in and run a scan and see what ports are open on that system. Let's do that and hit enter. And if it's up, okay, if it's, there's a couple things I want to kind of mention. If it's down, it'll come back and tell us that it's not online. But also remember that a lot of uh, network engineers will drop ICMP. They will not allow ICMP to return. So if you ping a machine, rather than allowing ICMP to echo reply, so ICMP is defined by echo request, okay, that's us asking for an answer, and then echo reply, right, which is the system coming back and answering us. A good network engineer who's security conscious oftentimes will simply not allow the system to reply because it's a way of hiding. It's a way of hiding the, the host, right? Not make it easy for the hacker. In that case, if that's the case, Nmap will just come back and say, oh, it doesn't exist because it won't start scanning until he, it knows the system is actually online. And I'll show you how to get past that in just a second. So Nmap ST, right, TCP scan, and then hit enter.
I think you need to put your 136 on on the end. I wasn't sure if you actually had typed this. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I got talking and I forgot to add the last octet. And then we hit enter and we start scanning. And it says, all right, it says host is up. Okay, it tells us host is up. All 1000 scan ports are ignored states. Okay, so what we can do now is just go back over to our dragon and let's start a Apache server. I think there's Apache on the system. So we'll go sudo to service Apache 2 start. Okay. So that's that's kind of the old terminology. You know, using the services, we can now use system control. Both of them will work on most Linuxes now. So I've started the Apache server to check to see whether the Apache server is running. I go ps dash aux and then grep. Okay, Apache 2. This will show me whether or not the Apache 2 system, Apache 2, is running. Apache 2, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is the world's most popular web server. Been around for 30 years now. And you can see that it's running over here. So I just use the, the PS, right, which is the, pro, the processes, and then the AUX switches. And then I grep, which is a filter, for Apache 2. All right, so I know it's running. Now I can go back to my Kali Linux and I'll scan again. And let's go and run it again and let's see what happens. And there it is. Yeah. HTTP is running. Now, that's really helpful. We know that port 80 is open, but we don't really know what the service is behind it, all right? We know that 80 is open and by default, that means it's HTTP, but what type of HD, what type of web server is it? Is it IIS? Is it Apache 2? Is it Nginx? Is it, you know, all of the, all of the various types of web servers. We can find that out by adding one simple switch, okay, to nmap and then some dash A. And then go dash A. It takes a little bit longer because what it's doing now is it's probing. It's sending out probes to every one of the ports that it finds open. In this case, it only finds one. And it's probing to determine what is actually running behind it. And you see it came back with a lot of information. It came back and told us that one, it's, it's Ubuntu, is the operating system, right? And it came back and said, it's Apache 2. And it actually read the, the default page and said, it worked, which is the default page on Apache. If you haven't seen it before, you can go to we'll go here, open up a browser on the system. And if we go localhost, which will take us to our Apache server on our system, there it is. It works. So this is the default page. So it's reading that and coming back uh, and telling us that. So a lot more information. We can also, if we just wanted to test for a single port, we can do dash P and then the port number. Right. Much quicker, simpler, all right, to do that. And it doesn't have to go through all the other ports. There it is. Okay, works great. Now, one of the things that a lot of people are new uh, to Nmap and some of the ethical hacking books and classes will tell you to do is to do a, an SS scan because that's a stealthy scan. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. you're right. You laugh and I laugh. It's not really very stealthy because the only difference between the TCP scan and the what they call a SYN scan or a stealthy scan is it doesn't complete the three-way handshake. Your IP address is still going to be attached to all those packets, all right? So it's not like you're really getting past anything at all. So I think it really isn't worth doing that, but to each their own. And so that's one of the, you know, I, what I think is kind of a, and it sometimes will not give you as good a result. Usually it'll give you about the same results as the T-scan, but it really isn't stealthy because the packets still have your IP address exactly. on it. The big, the, the big, the only difference is that the web server will not log a successful connection. That's the difference, right? So that's Nmap. I think you need to know Nmap. You know, it's one of those essential tools. It's the first step of active reconnaissance. The first step of active reconnaissance on any system. Right now, that's kind of begs the question. It's like, well, that's active reconnaissance. How about passive reconnaissance? <laughs> and, and so, one of the things that we can do, one of the 
best tools for doing passive reconnaissance is Shodan. Let's open up a Shodan here. And Shodan is a, a tool that was developed by, uh, what's his first name, Matherly. I don't remember his, what's his first name. His last name is Matherly. It's out of San Diego. He developed this 10 or 15 years ago. This is a tool that scans the world and pulls the banners off every IP address in the world, okay? That's pretty, that's a big task, right? <laughs> Think about that. There are 4.3 billion IP addresses. There's 65,000, what? 6,536 ports per IP address. That's a lot of, that's a lot of banners to grab. And so Masterly does this with Shodan. And there's a number of other tools that have followed on to Shodan to do things similar. But what's critical about this one is one, it's relatively simple to use, okay? And two, at least in the basic, in the basics, it's free. And for the basic Shodan use, it's free. So here's Shodan, right? Remember, Shodan is going ahead and pulling the banner, okay? The banner. So a banner is essentially a page that it, where the web server tells the world who they are, what they are, right? And so that's what Shodan does. Now, there are other tools that do things differently, but this is what Shodan does. It goes around and pulls the banner on all of these IP addresses and ports, and then takes that information and puts it into a database and then indexes it for us to search. Now, we can see this is just the Explore page. Okay, you have to, to get much from it, you have to create an account and log in. Now, they actually have paid accounts as well where you get even more uh, useful information. But you can see that I can go here and so, for instance, Ethereum miners. I, I can go ahead and click here. And these are going to show me all the Ethereum miners. Right? There's 8,400 of them. The cryptocurrency miners. Right? It's amazing so, what people connect to the internet. Yes. <laughs> Unreal. And so... So we have all the Ethereum miners out there. Yeah? Um, and you can see that most of them, looks of like a vast number are in Germany, right? And then U.S. And, and Finland. If we were to, uh, say, look for, say, over here, industrial control systems, which is one of the areas that I specialize in, and it's industrial control systems. Industrial control systems are really varied, okay? You can see there are different manufacturers of diff of of uh, industrial control systems. And the most widely used, but far from the majority, is Modbus. This is port 502. I can click on this, and I can see there's almost a half a million of these systems around the world, right? And so these are, choose me, every system. In this case, it defaults to port 502. Now, that's not necessarily going to be Modbus, but it shows me port 502. And if you really want to make certain that it is my bus, you can look for, let's go a little further down here. <laughs> we get a lot of 502s that are that probably are not my bus. But really the important point here is that you can use Shodan to find just about anything you want, okay? The interesting things, as you'll see, is that you can also look for keywords such as Conpot, Pot is the most widely used honeypot in industrial control systems. Oh, I didn't find any. Interesting. They must have taken them all down. There was just a few online just recently. Okay. And then we could go and say, oh, we all see those that are in China. We can just pull all those up in China. So it's a really, it's a great tool for finding. First of all, if you're a hacker, it's a great tool for finding potentially vulnerable systems that have particular characteristics, right? If you're somebody in cybersecurity, one of the things that you want to do is to check to see what Shodan has on your systems, right? Exactly. So if you're, if you're showing all this information to the world, right, you want to know that. So, you know, that's one of the things that you want to do if you're working in defense is to make sure that you're not giving away more information than you should than uh, in Shodan and some of these other search engines. Now, just as another example, we know that, for instance, uh, port 
3306 is used for uh, MySQL. So we can go and look for those. And here we go. This shows me 4.6 million. That's a lot of systems yep. using, using MySQL. So these are, you know, if we're looking for, and look at this end of life product here too. So <laughs> this is kind of important, right? Because that means it's no longer supported by the manufacturer developer in and updating it and giving it security updates. So this is to mean they're gonna be particularly vulnerable to attack. You can see the versions here, right? It is version 5.650, 5.742, right? These are old versions of MySQL, which makes them, makes them vulnerable. Yeah, and so that's the kind of thing that we can do here. You know, something that people always mention to me is that, well, you know, nobody ever runs those old operating <laughs> systems. <laughs> yeah. no, nobody ever yeah. runs those old operating systems on, uh, anymore. You know, nobody runs Windows XP, right? Okay. <laughs> That's the so, most common YouTube comment, right? Exactly. And so one of the ways we can do, we can actually search by operating system. So we go OS, right? And here I can see some of my previous searches, including those that are in Russia. Uh, here we use OS Windows 7. Let's go look Windows 7, right? No, nobody runs Windows 7 anymore, uh, right? Cool. Oh, I don't know why I'm getting these results here. Let's go, let's go back to just Windows 7. Okay, let's see if we can get that. There we go. <laughs> All right, so uh, my search with SMB uh, was returning nothing, but I got 42,000, okay, systems. 6,500 of them are in Russia, 5,600 in China, 34. Even in the U.S., you got 3,400. Now, this is not telling me how many systems are running Windows 7. This tells me specifically how many Windows 7 systems are connected to the internet, right? Exactly. This, yep. this is a 15-year-old operating system, and people are still using it to serve right, onto the, on the internet. Right. You can actually see that it pulls up even the, the, the login screen on these systems. So there's far more than this 42,000 because most of those older systems are not connected to the internet. These are just the ones connected to the internet. Of course, let's just go back another step and let's go XP. All right, let's see how many of those are. 5,777. So for all of you out there who say nobody, nobody <laughs> runs Windows 7, nobody runs Windows XP, I think to differ, right? Yeah. And one of the things that a lot of people who are new to this field, you know, one of the things as human beings that we do is that we think the rest of the world does the same things that we do, right? Exactly. We, we, extrap yeah. we extrapolate from what we're doing to the other 7 billion people on the planet. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and that's, that's dangerous to do, right? Because not everybody, or a, a common comment I'll get was, for none of my friends run Windows XP. <laughs> or, <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. I'm sure that's true that none of your friends win, run Windows XP. But there's at least 5,777 people who are running Windows XP and have it connected to the internet, right? Now, these XP systems are really vulnerable to all types of attacks, right? But people are still using them. So be careful in trying to extrapolate your own personal experience, your own world, to everything else in the world. Yeah. That's just a general rule of advice. life, right? Yeah, you need advice. to, not everybody is doing things the same way you do it. And we might ask the question, why are these people still running XP? And there's a large number of reasons that they still are, but they're really putting themselves at risk that by continuing to attach these systems to the internet. But this is just a good example of what Shodan can do for us in terms of scanning the globe. One caveat, one warning about using Shodan is the data is usually a few weeks old, right? Because he can't scan the whole world every day. It's just not, he's not possible. Sometimes you'll find a system that appears here, and then when you go and actually try, say, running an Nmap scan on it, you'll find that it's not there anymore or certain ports have been closed. So just kind of a, is a, uh, a warning. Now, we wanted to see, say, port, just combine. We can just combine searches, right, 3306. And this will show us all the systems 
that uh, have, and it's none of them. Uh, let's go 1433, which is a SQL server. All right, and see if we wouldn't expect necessarily. There we go. So this is the port for the SQL server database on Windows. So, and these are all the systems. Those are all end of life OS, end of life products. So this particular system in France is running a operating system that is end of life OS and end of life product, both, right? You can see these are all very, very vulnerable systems. Okay? And most of them are in Korea, it looks like. They're not most of them, but the largest number are in Korea. So that's probably the first tool that you need to know for passive reconnaissance. I think it's the, it's the easiest to learn. Okay, you can basically search by country. So if I wanted to go by country as well, I could go, go country and say, yeah. And all of those that are in uh, Spain, I think Spain is ES, is that right? Yeah. yeah. And there's all of them. So I got 40, I've narrowed it down to 46 systems that are running Windows XP port 440. So it's both Windows XP and SQL Server in Spain. I've gotten really specific here, right? And I've narrowed it down to 46 systems on the planet that meet that criteria. So that's tool number three. Let's keep on moving on. The next tool I want to show you is probably one of the most essential tools in doing web app hacking, which everybody wants to do, right? Everybody wants to hack web applications. And there's one tool that nearly everybody uses in web app hacking, and that's called the Burp Suite, okay? Uh, and it's gonna be, you're gonna find it up here under web application analysis, and there it is, the Burp Suite. Now, built into Kali is the free version. There is a paid version too that they charge, I think, $395 a year for. But for most, especially if you're just starting out, you're not gonna to want to invest $400. You can do most everything in the free version, there's a few things you can, but if you're just starting out, you don't have to have those capabilities. So it comes back and says, I accept the terms and conditions. Of course I do. Of course <laughs> I accept all of these conditions. <laughs> I, and I've read, I've read all of them in my 10 seconds there, and I agree to all of them. And then as a, as a beginner and using the free version, you can't, you can't save as a temporary project. That's one of the drawbacks. So notice it's a community edition. And so I go next, and then I can start Burp, okay? What Burp does for us is that it allows us to intercept. It's, it's a proxy, right? So it's a proxy that allows us to intercept web traffic and then manipulate it or in whatever way we want, we can first of all analyze it, okay? And then we can manipulate it between our browser and the server. So once the traffic leaves our browser, we can pick it up, we can proxy it. That's what it's called. It's, it's like, kind of like a, a man in the middle. We're capturing it between the browser and the server and we can analyze it and we can manipulate it. So with, first of all, we go ahead and turn on the proxy, okay? and turn our intercept on. Notice here we can hit look at our history. Let's go ahead and create some history. Okay, let's open up a browser. Your Burp Suite now has built into it, I think the Chrome browser, and uh, it works best with the Chrome browser. Of course, the Chrome browser has its own issues. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then we'll go to, uh, you can use it with other browsers. It just takes a little bit more knowledge. And so you can start to see the traffic coming up there. What you would need to do to use it in the, the say, Mozilla is, well, we'll let. Oh, did we do that in the a previous class? We may have. I don't I'm think not so. sure. I, don't, I, don't think, I think so. we did. Yeah, I did think we? so. Okay. Yeah, I think we did. And you see, here's the, the intercept side. And so what we see here right, is the it intercepted, okay, the packet from my browser to the web server. Now, this opens up all kinds of possibilities of what we can do, right? So one of the basics of, this is the first step oftentimes in web app hacking, is you, first of all, you have to know 
what's going on in the packets. Right? So this is kind of the analysis stage is that you can go ahead and see in each one of the packets. So if I go forward right here, I can see each one of the packets. There's, only, no, there's another one. So I've gone through three packets and I can begin to analyze how the browser is communicating with the server and how the server is communicating with the browser. Once I know that, then I have some basic information that I can use to be able to attack the web application. There's a number of other tools built into this. For instance, there's a sequencer and a decoder. The one that most people are interested in when they start out is what's called the intruder. You've got to go, what you do here with the intruder is it allows you to go and, for instance, try cracking remote passwords. So if you've got a password on this system, so for instance, what we can do is we can go right click, send to intruder, and then it'll send this packet. We can send this packet repeatedly to the server. Now, this is not a login screen, but if it was a login screen, I can go ahead and send a password list to the login screen. Now, let's, let's see. Uh, probably, there's probably, a, um, without using a, it's probably going to get ourselves into trouble with YouTube with this. So I probably yeah, don't want, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't want to do that. But I will just say that we can, you can use this if, you know, you don't have to search very far on the web and on hackers' eyes on how to use this to go ahead and crack passwords. Now, as a password cracking tool, it's not the best in the community edition because it, they actually put a governor on it that, that limits the speed that you can go through passwords. Okay, But if you buy the, the professional edition, there's no limit. It's still not the fastest password cracker, but it does a really good job of identifying the fields Okay, that you need to be able to log into a website and then try to do remote password cracking. But it's one of those tools that if you're going to work in web application security, you're going to, you know, if you want to test your own website for vulnerabilities, if you're trying to hack a website, this is the first step. You really need to use the Burp Suite. The Burp Suite is like, it's one of those essential tools. We can't go, we don't have time to go into all of the capabilities but it's a really capable tool and it's for free in the community edition. All right, let's close this That would be a whole down. course in itself. It is a whole course. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, a week long course and just doing the burp suite. Just wanted to, right now, we're just trying to show you the basics of all the tools that are out there. Next on our list is going to be Metasploit. Metasploit is um, a tool that um, Basically what it does is that it allows you to take all of the off the shelf tools, you know, not all of them, but many of the off the shelf tools, puts them into a single tool that you can use them. So let's go ahead and just do it. To open up Metasploit, you can either go to exploitation tools, right? And there's our Metasploit framework there, or you can go MSF console. What this does is that it opens up an interactive console for Metasploit, and inside of Metasploit, there's thousands of tools. So that's the advantage of it. It's not always the latest and greatest in terms of exploits and tools, but it saves you a lot of time if you're working on, say, you know, a vulnerable system. You can search here to go and find the tool that's going to work against that system. Once again, this is a whole week long course on how to use Metasploit, but I'll just show you a little. First of all, you gotta know that the terminology, these are exploits. These are essentially, these are hacks. These are tools that allow you to get inside of a system. Auxiliary, okay, those are all of the tools that don't fit into the other categories. <laughs> that are not, that are not, they're not payloads, encoders, NOPs, and the invasion or exploits. There's, 1,220 of those, okay? These are, often these are uh, scanners and password crackers in this area. These are post-exploitation. So after you've cracked open the system, what can you do with it? Can you turn on the camera? Can you turn on the, the uh, a key logger? Can you, you know, there's a whole lot of things that you can do. Can you scan the other systems to be able to pivot to other machines on the network? That's all gonna be in 
post-exploitation. Payloads are what you leave behind, okay? Once I cracked open the system, I gotta leave behind on the system something that allows me to be able to connect to that system, you know, whenever I want to. That's a payload. Then we have encoders. These are things that will change the encoding of the tool. NOPs are called null operations. This is often used in developing your own exploits. And then we have nine evasion. So these are ways that we can change the tool to help it get past antivirus. Now, the way that you need to, to find what you're looking for, and this is kind of the key, now the first stages of Metasploit is, how do I find what I'm looking for? Exactly, I see yeah. that there's, I, I see that there's like, you know, 8,000 modules here, right? How do I find what I'm looking for? Well, here's how you find it. You just use the keyword search, and then you tell it what type of module I'm looking for, type. And I say, I want to export. Of course, we always want exploits, right? <laughs> exploits. <laughs> and, and then, I then I can then give it a keyword, or I can go platform, which platform is kind of, it's all synonymous with operating system. You can go Windows, and then say we are looking for the Eternal Blue exploit. Eternal Blue, for those of you who don't know, I do uh, an expansive um, analysis of Eternal Blue and getting started becoming a master hacker because it's one of those exploits that was so widely used and so dangerous that it allowed basically the NSA, it was developed by the NSA in the US to hack into just about any Windows system, right? And when it, was, when it got released onto the internet, okay, in 2017, so it's six years ago now, it was used by criminal hackers to be able to do Petya, not Petya, wannabe, many, many ransomwares. It caused billions of dollars worth of damage. So we can find that okay, by simply using that search. And you can see it came up with three different ones. And then here's the original 2017, it's MS17010. Then here's one that has uh, this one right here, a PS exec. This basically just allows you to connect if it's already been compromised. And then here's the one with the double pulsar remote code execution. And so we've got three different ones. If we were to not put in exploit and just look for the eternal blue, we'll find a few more auxiliary modules. Well, maybe not. <laughs> Let's see, Windows, yeah. It, there is a scanner, there's a eternal romance. There it is right there. Yep. Let's see if we can't, let's just take out, we should be able to find the auxiliary module. Let's go type. You go auxiliary, and this is a, a vulnerability scanner for eternal blue. There should be one there. There we go. And this one will go ahead and test to see whether or not the system is vulnerable to eternal blue. And this one here is basically checking to see whether or not there's the remote code execution taking place on the system already. So somebody's already compromised. So that's how you would go about finding, you know, you can, you know, there's, there's all kinds of modules in here. Let's do, do one more search of a search, All right? And let's go type auxiliary and let's go say uh, MySQL. MySQL, we got 14, 14 modules. These are auxiliary modules, right? These auxiliary modules aren't necessarily exploits. Sometimes they are, like here you see MySQL authentication bypass, hash dump here. It's an enumeration module. These are scanners. Here's one for testing the login, here's getting the version of MySQL, so lots of different modules in there. So Metasploit is one of those white hat hacker tools. We have seen it being used as well by black hats, uh, especially if we're talking about a systems, systems like we saw just on Shodan, where we know that there are vulnerabilities there. There's, there's widely known vulnerabilities. One doesn't have to go and create their own exploit you know, we can just go and grab that exploit out of Metasploit and go ahead and take control of the system. I think the question is going to be, uh, Occupy the Web, you've got training on all this stuff, right? So, um, I mean, you, you're only just touching on it on, on, in this video. Sorry, go on. Yeah, we're, we're just, just touching on each one of them. We have classes in each one of these. Hey, David, we're, um, what we're doing now is we're going to go and just to 
test this eternal blue in Metasploit, the, win the eternal blue exploit against a vulnerable Windows 7 system, Great. just to show just to show what it looks like. Right? That's fantastic, yeah. So what I've done is I've loaded the exploit right here, I, the use command. It goes ahead by default and it puts in a payload, okay, reverse TCP. And then I can do show options. This shows me all the options that I need to set to make this exploit work. And you can see here, required column. Well, if it says required, that means you have to put it in. Right? And here you can see our host. Our host stands for remote host. That's the target. Here's the target port. This you can't change because this is an attack against SMB. So what we need to set is the our host, right? And you can see it's already automatically set the L host, that's us, the attacker. So it looks like the only thing we need to set with this particular exploit is the R host. And we can do that by using the set command. Set R host. Okay. And that's going to be one nine. This is the uh, IP address of the Windows 7 system. And it's going to be 109. So we've said we want to attack 192, 168, 100. Nine. We want it to communicate back to us at 192.168.100.101. And so all that we need to do now is simply say exploit and the system will attempt. Now I say attempt because it doesn't always work, you know, unlike the, the TikTok videos where that <laughs> always works every time. In reality, hacks can some, even the well-worn well-known hacks don't work all the time. That's reality. That's, you know, it's not 30 seconds unless you take over, <laughs> you know, the world's most secure server. <laughs> to take over the world's most secure server, you might spend years to get inside of it. All right, but here we have an attack that's well-known against a vulnerable system, and it still doesn't work every time. So we'll keep our fingers crossed that it works for us this time, and we'll just go exploit and keep our fingers crossed and see what happens. You can see it comes back and says, it's likely vulnerable, and it opened up a interpreter session. Yay! Nice. nice. So it did work this time, easily and simply. We could do a TikTok video now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so now we're inside the Windows system, okay? So we can, to check to see whether or not we're actually in, we can go Notice that we're getting some air communication there. Here, that kind of worries me. But let's see, sys info should tell us. Yep, there we are. We're in OTW's Windows Seven system, All right? Or we could do a, a dir to check those directories. Ah, oh, some TikTok on the system, <laughs> and WannaCry too. This is that's obviously I use for for. Uh, various, uh, these are actually exploits that I've developed to work on the system. Uh, and then of course we could also just do uh, IF content to see what the IP address is on. So we're inside, we are inside and controlling a Windows system. Now, once again, this is not, it's not always this easy. So I don't want to deceive your viewers that, you know, it's, you can just go ahead and point and click, you know, at a at a Windows system and immediately take it over. Even a Windows 7 system, because many of them, not all of them, but most of them are already patched, right? This I kept this Windows 7 system unpatched for years and years and years just for this purpose. But this is how Metasploit works. You know, you need to just find the right exploit, right? The correct exploit that's going to match the operating system, and the various features, characteristics of that system. Sometimes the characteristics are going to be ports that are open. Sometimes it's going to be an application that's on that system. Sometimes in this case, it's going to be what version of SMB is on that system. In this case, SMB1 is vulnerable. Okay, If it's running SMB3, it's not going to be vulnerable. So that's Metasploit. I think that's number five on my list. So we're gonna sh shut that one down. Okay. Okay. The next tool that we want to talk about is Snort. Now, Snort is not. Let's reemphasize. It's not a hacking tool. Instead, it's a defensive tool. 
It is a tool. It's what's called an intrusion detection system. It's a, it's a system that is looking for attacks against your system and then sends you an alert that it's, you know, this looks suspicious. This looks like it might be somebody trying to attack your system. And you know, one of the things that you and I talked about in an earlier video is that I used it in Linux Basics for Hackers as an example. You can use, you can use any file for an example, but I wanted to use Snort just because it's a widely used cybersecurity tool. It's now owned by Cisco and uh, their Talos group was originally an independent company that they purchased. And that's part of their cybersecurity group within Cisco. And as you know, and you've pointed out several times, Cisco's really emphasizing cybersecurity. It's a big new initiative on their part. They started off as a networking company and they were very successful at that. They became the biggest in the world. And now they're really pushing cybersecurity, which they should. Right? And part of that is they purchased well, they just recently purchased Splunk, right? And then they purchased Snort like in 2014. So Snort is, was the world's most widely used intrusion detection system. And although you may not see its name out there, it's built into a lot of IDSs, including the Cisco products. Even other manufacturers, because it's open source, other manufacturers can use it as their back-end software and then put a different front end on a different GUI on the front end of it. Snort, if you want to go ahead and download it out of the, one of the package managers, uh, you can get it from the Debian package manager. I think Ubuntu also has it built in there. It is not in the Kali repository any longer, unfortunately. But all you have to do is, as you know, all you Linux experts out there is you need to go to your sources, the Etsy apt sources list, right? I'll open it up. Okay, so we'll just use, we'll go um, mouse pad, and then we'll go Etsy uh, apt sources list. All right, you open up this file, and this is where your system looks for packages, all right? These are the repositories. And so you can see that I've got several of them in here, including right here, this is the Debian package manager. And this is where you will find it, right? It is available there, as well as other places as well. So you just need to add this to your sources list and then do update, sudo apt update, and then it'll update your packages. So Snort is designed to be able to sniff on your wire, okay, your ethernet or whatever the, the interface you have could be used on a wireless interface, it could be used on a wired interface, but it's designed to sniff the package, each packet that comes along to sniff it and determine whether or not that packet is malicious or not. If you're a hacker, the beauty of understanding Snort is that you understand what the security devices are doing that you're trying to get past, right? You know, you want to know what, how are they trying to determine whether or not this packet is malicious, and what can I do to evade their detection? If you're a cybersecurity pro, of course, you want to understand this tool to be able to use to alert you. And also, if you're really adept at it, you can enhance it to do even better than what it's designed to do. And we have a class coming up in early 20, we, we've done a class on Snort, but we're going to do a new updated version this spring on Snort. So for those people who are interested in getting to understand, understand this tool better, we have that coming up in the very near future, in a few months. So to run Snort, all you need to do is go Snort and then uh, dash VDE are the switches. Uh, we could go ahead and just do a dash H to look at the help screen. There's lots, once again, there's a lot of options, but we can boil it all down to a very simple command. Artie Roche, okay, is the uh, one who developed it. Uh, I think he's now, he's a venture capitalist that we've now, he's no longer doing cybersecurity, but he, he developed this in 99, I think, at, while he was working. He was working at um, 
GTE in Canada, if I remember correctly, 98, this was right here, right? And then the, he sold it to a company called Sourcefire, and then Cisco bought Sourcefire, and it's still a viable product, okay? It's still out there, it's still open source, so you can still use it for free. It well if you know how to use it. And so we can boil down the command to dash V D E, okay? and then dash C, and then the location of the configuration file. And that configuration file is going to be at Etsy, snort, usually, not always, but usually, snort, cuff. Mm -hmm. And if I typed it all correctly, we should get it to run, and it'll begin sniffing on my wire. It comes back and says, Parsing rules file, snort count, permission denied. When I see that, that immediately tells me that I, I'm not root and I need to be root. So that's all I need to do. And there it goes. So, so what snort is doing is it's taking every packet and examining it. And it'll look at the header first. And then we'll start looking in the payload to see whether or not anything in that packet matches known exploits. And if it does, it'll send you an alert and you can determine where those alerts go to. It can go into a database. It can go into your log files. It can go into your alert files. You see every packet coming across here. Right? And so this is an excellent tool. You know, it's as good as any, I can say this, I think unequivocally, it's as good as any of the commercial tools. It just has a little bit of longer learning curve. You know, the, the commercial tools that you'll pay thousands of dollars for are, are excellent tools like Palo Alto Networks and others, but Snort does just as good a job, but it has a little bit longer learning curve and being able to understand how it works and how you can enhance its capabilities. And that's part of what we try to teach you our upcoming snort class. Okay. I love so that it's part of like firewalls, like PFSense has it. So you can just use it at home for free. Right. It's fantastic. Yeah. Use it, use it at home for free, right? Yeah. Use it at home, use it at your small business, you know, and if you're, this cybersecurity is your industry, you know, it's a good way to train yourself in how IDSs work because Really, they're all working the same way. I mean, they're all going ahead and examining each packet. They sniff off the wire, they examine the packet. Now the rule set and the way they apply rule sets, there's some variation there, but basically we're looking at the same process. And if you're not willing to spend the thousands of dollars to buy one of those commercials and you're just learning, this is a good place to learn because it's all right. free. Mm -hmm. exactly. As doing the same thing that the commercial products are doing, giving you a good background in IDSs. All right, I'm gonna stop it from Control C. Okay, I'm gonna clear my screen. The next tool that I want to mention as uh, being an excellent tool for anybody in cybersecurity is Nessus. Nessus is the most widely used vulnerability scanner out there. I mean, it's, it's been used for many years. It's owned by a company now called Tenable. It started as an open source project. You can still get Nessus for free, I believe. Let me see if I can show you where you can get it at. They have a, a home version that's still free or a trial version. I'm gonna put it up on the screen here. And uh, it's also, Nessus is included in my getting started becoming a master hacker class, I mean, master hacker book, okay? This is Nessus by Tenable. Started off as a open source project. You can see up here, there's a try and a buy. And sometimes you have to look around a little bit to find the free versions, but there's still free versions out there. And so here's a, let's go take a look at the try. All right, so what'll happen is that they'll give you a free version for seven days and you can go ahead and scan all your systems. Usually there's a limited number, like on the free version, there used to be 16 IP addresses. So for a small office, home office, that's gonna be more than adequate. Now, if you go to buy it, it's pretty pricey, okay? $5,300 per year. But usually, let's just see if I can find uh, their Home Essentials. They used to have a product called Home Essentials that was free up to 16 IP addresses. Let's see what we can find here. Let's see if this tech dims it up. Okay, as part of the Tenable Nessus, when Tenable Nessus allows you to scan, oh, there it is, up to 16 IP addresses with the same high-speed 
that subscribers enjoy, okay? Please note that Nessus Essentials does not allow you to perform compliance checks or content audits, live results, or use a Nessus virtual appliance. Using Nessus Essentials for education, mm -hmm. register here and you can get it, all right? I do have in Master Hacker Book a demonstration of uh, how to use Nessus. Uh, we use the Nessus Essentials, the 16 IP address. Um, I think, David, we should do a, a, a tutorial just on Nessus in the future. That'd be great, yeah. But this is, I put this on the list because you need to have some familiarity being in cybersecurity of how to use vulnerability scanners. Now, there's lots and lots of vulnerability scanners out there. Nessus has been around longer than most of them have, and it's widely used. It's, it's the most widely used. So let's do, let's plan on doing a tutorial on That'd using be Nessus because it's a really good tool for identifying potential vulnerabilities in your system because it doesn't necessarily find all the vulnerabilities, it finds potential vulnerabilities and then it can narrow down your task of trying to be able to patch and make your system uh, harder for a hacker to get into. Now, everybody who's starting out in hacking wants to hack Wi-Fi, right? And so, <laughs> and so the granddaddy the granddaddy of Wi-Fi hacking tools, the original, is Aircrack. And Aircrack, I'll just open it up here. Aircrack, NG. That's Aircrack, NG. Let's give it a dash H for a help screen. And it tells me that my help screen is at dash dash help. Okay. I mean, we could spend, you know, once again, a whole class on Aircrack. Right? You can see that it has multiple methods of being able to crack Wi-Fi. This is when the WEP attack first came out in the early part of the 21st century. Yeah, it was widely used for that. So here's some PSK. This would be modern systems, right? Or that usually uh, WPA2. And so this, this tool is great for being able to hack uh, Wi-Fi passwords. You know, one of the things that has happened is that with WPA2, essentially what you're doing is you're trying to guess the password. You're, you're, you're creating a good password list and then using Aircrack or others to crack it. So the first thing Aircrack does is it connects to your system, okay? Let's point out, first of all, to use Aircrack and some of these other Wi-Fi cracking tools, you have to have an air crack compliant Wi-Fi adapter, right? And I recommend the Alpha cards. You know, they're they're cheap. They're relatively cheap. They work really well. You don't have to have the latest and greatest, so you can go out and buy a used one off eBay or other places, and they're going to work just as well for you because really speed is not the key to the speed of the Wi-Fi connection is not going to really make a whole lot of difference. The, the CPU speed is what's going to help you be able to crack the password. So you can go out and buy a cheap one for $10, $15, $20. I think new they cost $40, $50. And this tool will allow you to be able to uh, at least attempt to crack your passwords. But you have to first have a Wi-Fi a, a ear crack compliant adapter. If you're using a uh, virtual machine, you're gonna have to have, even though you're using a laptop with a Wi-Fi adapter in it, you're gonna have to go ahead and connect via USB your new ear crack compatible adapter. Usually it's gonna be an L4 or something. Because even though right now, so for instance, right now I'm connected via Wi-Fi. But for my virtual machine, if I go IW list, which is the, the wireless interface list, okay? Now let's go IW config. You yeah. see, I go IW config, and you can see all the interfaces, which I have five of them on the system, but none of them are wireless. But in reality, I am connected via wireless, but that wireless connection, that Wi-Fi connection, is then piped through an ETH connection from my host 
to my virtual machine. This is not an issue if you're using Kali on bare metal, you're using it as your primary operating system. But in my case here, I'm using Windows 10 with Kali as a virtual machine. If you're doing that, you're gonna to need to have an extra Wi-Fi adapter via USB to be able to crack passwords. Now for a beginner in this field, there are a number of GUIs, okay? Because AirCrack, it's not that hard to use, but it, it does take a little bit of knowledge, okay? And I have, I have a, a, a three-part video series that users can view on Wi-Fi cracking, looking at many different techniques. But there are some GUIs that you can use that make it a little simpler, and they're all built upon air crack. And one of them is Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is basically a GUI that sits on top of air crack and makes cracking passwords a little bit simpler. Notice it says run as a sudo, so I'm gonna go sudo Wi-Fi. And it's going ahead and it's telling me that I need to go ahead and put in some extra tools if I want to use them. I don't have to install these, all right? These are, this tool, these two tools right here are useful for being able to use what's called a PMKID attack, which is an interesting attack where it allows you to get the hash right out of the AP without having to capture it between the client and the server or the AP. And so this is a relatively new, it's a two or three year old attack. But this tool is, is basically a GUI on top of the uh, of air crack. And it's an excellent tool, simple to use, right? And so I recommend it if you're just starting out in, in Wi-Fi hacking. Then moving on to the next one, right? We're not gonna do any Wi-Fi hacking here, but I just wanted to show you some, a couple of the tools, right? Next, we have a tool that's probably the best one out there right now for password cracking, and that's Hashcat. Hashcat, okay, here's Hashcat. It's got a really, really long, okay, <laughs> help screen. Yeah. Yeah. It's very complicated, but it's an excellent tool. Great. Right? Yeah. And one of the things that we were looking at right here is this is all the different types of hashes. So to be able to crack a hash, you first of all have to identify what type of hash it is, right? And oftentimes you can do that. There's tools that are built into Kali uh, that'll help you identify the hash. Uh, for instance, if I remember correctly, we use hash identify. I gotta spell it right. All right. Um, if you have a hash and you wanna know what type of hash it is, there it is. This tool will allow you to put a hash into right here at this prompt, and it'll tell you what type of hash it is. Once you know what type of hash it is, then you can use a tool like Hashcat to crack it. And Hashcat is probably right now the best password cracking tool out there. But the first step, of course, is once you grab your hash, use Hash Identifier, or there's other tools like it that they're not 100% accurate, but they're pretty accurate. They'll give you like 98% accuracy. Occasionally they'll get it wrong, but this is an excellent tool for identifying. And I'm not putting Hash Identifier on my 10. It's more of a, a tool that you need as kind of a, a helper to using Hashcat. Next, okay, I want to, move a little bit into some more, little bit more sophisticated tools that the user and the viewers might be interested in. One of them that came out a few years ago was called Ghidra. Okay, and Ghidra, Ghidra is, a, is a tool that was developed by NSA. So if you have, you have, a, you have a lot of reservations about, uh, about uh, oh, I'll just, I'll just pull up some nice um, pictures of, I don't know if I have it on this system but I'll pull up some uh, screenshots of it. So that Gitro was developed by the NSA for doing engineering. And previous to them releasing this as an open source project, you, know, you had to spend some serious money for things like I, Ida Pro and others. And this tool does almost everything that Ida Pro does, and it's free. So you can get it, and here's that. This is Ghidra here. And this is actually an analysis of, we were working with WannaCry right here. WannaCry was one of those tools that was used the eternal blue as, a, as its entry point. 
uh, for ransomware. And so in one of our classes, we were doing an analysis of it, and we used Ghidra to do it. We have a class coming up in February in reverse engineering. We'll be using Ghidra extensively in that class. So it's one of those tools. It's kind of an advanced tool. I wouldn't say that it's a entry-level tool by any means because Reverse engineering is kind of an advanced topic, but it's one of those tools that's free. And the more you know about it, the more you're going to understand malware. And the more you understand malware, the better you're going to be as a cybersecurity pro and as a hacker. I think it's one of those essential tools that advance at least to the intermediate level is to be able to use Ghidra. And the beauty of it is that it's free. Keep that on your list. And then as my final tool, all right? And you know, this is kind of goes to what I was saying, I've been saying repeatedly on your show and to my students, is that I believe that hacking radio signals is really the, the next level in terms of, and, and David, you've done a number of, of tutorials using Flipper Zero yeah. and, and it's been widely acclaimed and used around the world, but I really prefer the Hack RF. The Hack RF has been around for a while, and, and the difference really between the Flipper Zero and Hack RF is that the Hack RF is basically a transceiver, right? With very, it has a little bit of software, has some firmware built into it. But your computer, okay, and all of its capabilities and all of the tools that you can download into your Kali or Dragon OS. Remember, we talked a little bit about Dragon OS. Dragon OS has hundreds of radio hacking tools. And in most cases, the Hack RF One, which is about a $350 tool. So let's be clear, it's not free by any means. It's very capable of handling all of those radio hacking tasks. You know, it's not the best it's not the fastest, but it certainly gives the beginner a capability to do a lot of the radio hacking. Its limitations are speed, okay? It's relative slow compared to some of the more advanced tools. And the other limitation is that it's only half duplex. It can only send or receive and can't do them simultaneously. So there are some attacks where you need to have will send and receive at the same time. And some of the more advanced tools can do that. But if you're starting out and you want to get started in becoming you know, a radio hacker, which, my God, it's like, it's one of those really unexplored areas that exactly. I'm, yeah. so, I'm so glad the Flipper Zero came out because the Flipper Zero has made everybody aware of all the possibilities of radio hacking we've been ignoring for all these years. Exactly. And so we've begun a series of classes on radio hacking. We just did one last week on cell system hacking. Uh, we have one coming out on satellite hacking in 2024 and an advanced radio hacking in 2024. So I throw that out there because I want to make people aware of, hey, if you're starting out in hacking, don't limit yourself to TCP IP because there's so many other things out there, you know, like even your Wi-Fi, your cell phone, your satellite connections, your remote control. You know, these are all radio signals. And it's just, we're just on the cutting edge of exploring what we can do in terms of hacking those types of signals. So with that, I think that concludes my 10 my 10 best, my 10 most important, let's put it that way. And let's come back in a later episode. Let's do an episode just on Nessus, and maybe we can even do an episode just on Metasploit and explore deeper, deeper into those tools. Um, I think there's a, an awful lot of people who cover Wi-Fi hacking out there. So, I mean, if somebody but really like wants Dragon to But like Dragon OS might be a good one. What's that? Dragon, Dragon OS, OS. I'd, yeah. I'd love to do Dragon OS. Dragon yeah. OS is great. And uh, we maybe can do some some relatively simple, using the Hack RF, That'd be some great, simple yeah. radi radio hacks that uh, the beginners might be interested in doing. Occupy the Web, I really want to thank you for sharing so much knowledge. But I know this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? Because you, you know so much. So can you show us your website? And I believe you've got good news about your website, right? 
Yes, here's, here's our website right here. And we have a brand new website coming up in January. Well, we hope to have it complete. It's, it's in the final stages here. This is our old website we're looking at right here, but we're gonna have a new website uh, with the same material and more material, but maybe uh, a little easier to navigate and find what you're looking for. Um, so this is our, our current website. And you know we're always adding to it, like every week we post something new and different on it. Here's a ransomware, a build your own ransomware there, among other things. Uh, so hopefully, if you really want to learn more about any of these subjects that we talked to talked about, there's more free tutorials here on Hackers Rise. And if you really are serious about studying cybersecurity, we offer multiple packages that uh, the individual can purchase and delve deeper into those, including our ultimate package is what we call Subscriber Pro, which includes all of our courses, both the entry level to the advanced and everything in between. And it's a three-year program. So after three years, you know, you can become a professional cybersecurity expert, a professional cyber warrior. I've listened to some of your courses. I haven't attended them live because you do live, but I've I've watched some of the um the recordings and they're fantastic. So I mean, for everyone who's watching, I mean, you've just seen Occupy the Web teach a whole bunch of stuff, and um, he goes in a lot more detail in his courses. Highly recommended. I've put links below. It's an affiliate link. So Occupy the Web, thank you for supporting the channel by you know giving me an affiliate li affiliate link. So everyone who's watching, I highly suggest you go and uh, buy those courses if you can afford it. But otherwise, you know, use the free content. We've got lots and lots of videos on my channel, and Occupy the Web has also been interviewed in other channels. Occupy the Web is always. I really, really, really want to thank you. you you know, for helping the next generation and spreading the knowledge and not just teaching hackers, but like teaching people who want to defend networks. I know you've, you, you've told me previously that you've had people from the military and all kinds of places come to your courses to see what hackers can actually do so that they can protect themselves. Hey, we, we recently got some students coming in from a, a special uh, police unit in Belgium just signed up. And so we, we're real pleased to have them. And that was a nice thing for them to come in. They signed up as subscriber pro. I also want to just put a plug in, in that we're offering 20% off, right? For the viewers on your channel. I appreciate by it. By using the coupon code BOMBO, just David's last name. And you get automatically 20% off on anything. I appreciate it, man. Thanks so much for supporting the community, you know, and, um, in the old, old days, uh, you know, people used to try and like hide their knowledge or store it because they didn't want to lose their jobs. And I, you know, I appreciate you sharing it with the young people or people who are trying to get into cyber. Thanks. Thanks, David. I've always, I enjoy sharing my knowledge and hopefully people appreciate, you know, what we're doing here together. And so I hope to keep coming back and doing Definitely. more and more of these with you. So for everyone who's watching, you know, I really want to get Occupy the Web back. You've got to give us ideas of the things that you want to see. We've we've already given some ideas, but put in the comments below the stuff that you want to see. Occupy the Web, looking forward to many, many more interviews. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, David. Bye.